Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm sorry I didn't understand anything you said, but I saw the pictures, uh, which looked horrific. Um, I take it both were from China. One was uh, both the video and the pictures were from China. So uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to be uh, back in, uh, in Japan and an opportunity to talk to you. Um, and, in, and again, talk about Ayn Rand's ideas, which I think are, are so important. So in introducing the concept of individual rights and talking about the concept of individual rights, I want to first, before we get to kind of what's going on in China or what might be relevant in, uh, for, for us in the, in the Pacific Rim or in the United States or globally, I think what's really important is first to understand why we should care for us, and then we can think about them. Why do we care about freedom? Why do we care about liberty? What's in it for us when it comes to freedom and liberty? In many parts of the world, you know, there's this notion that freedom has, that, that people have in their hearts, everybody wants to be free. But 99.99% of human history, people have lived unfree lives and just lived them without complaining. Or if they complained, without doing anything about it. The natural, if you will, condition under which human beings have evolved since the beginning of time has been unfree. And unfree, I mean, where coercion, force, has been applied to them. They've been told what to do, and they've been doing what they were told to do. Most of our ancestors, almost all of our ancestors, were unfree. And, you know, unless you have some aristocratic blood in you, and you were part of the masters who told everybody what to do. And even they are not really free. They're dependent on the serfs to do what they say. Otherwise... They don't last very long, and of course, they're dependent on the other masters to not come and slaughter them and kill them. So there's very little evidence to suggest that freedom is just there and just waiting to gush out. We see time and time again, countries, peoples have the opportunity to embrace freedom and turn away from it. We see countries that have been free turn authoritarian. So freedom is an achievement. Freedom is something that takes real intellectual work and a real cultural commitment to it. And for freedom to become the dominant view, the dominant approach in a culture, it has to be a certain attitude. It has to be clear to people it has to be clear why we should be advocates of freedom. So what's, why freedom, why freedom, why liberty? Well, freedom and liberty are important if you care about your life. If you want to live the best life that you can live. And if you believe you have the tools to be able to live such a life. So for example, if you're taught from when you're very young that your mind doesn't matter, that reality, eh, maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't, only, I don't know, the Pope knows. Truth comes from an ancient book or from some form of revelation. And you have to have experts to tell you how to live, what to do, and that's your only option because you are impotent when it comes to actually conceiving of a good life. Then freedom is not very valuable to you. What are you going to do? You're dependent on them anyway. You're impotent. Your mind is impotent. Your ability to live is constrained. So you're dependent on somebody else for your own life anyway. So why be free? If you think about uh, many religious cultures, do not embrace freedom for that reason. Because there's an authority. Who am I? We just do what's written in the book. We don't think for ourselves. 
So one of the first ideas that you have to have if you're going to establish freedom is the efficacy of the individual's mind, the efficacy of reason, our ability to think, to understand reality, to know reality, and therefore to act on our own behalf based on our own judgment. And that our own judgment is valid. That we don't rely on some mystical ability to commune, to, to, to know anything. If you will, you, you can think of this, uh, you know, there's a, there's a sense in which this uh, struggle around freedom goes back, at least in the West. You'll have to tell me, you know, what the parallels are if there are any in Japan. But it goes back to kind of a, 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 this, this uh, debate between Plato and Aristotle, right? Plato tells us, what? That where do you find knowledge? You find knowledge in some other dimension. And only certain people have the ability to discover that knowledge. And most of us will never know, will never see real reality, will never be able to judge for ourselves. So politically, that leads to an idea of a philosopher king, somebody who can get that knowledge and therefore rule over us. And it's in our interest to do what he says, because he's the one who knows what's really going on. We're ignorant. We just don't know. A, he has this metaphor of a cave. We're just in a cave looking at shadows. Right? They can see the real world. They can see the sunlight. Versus Aristotle, who tells us, no, 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 no. The world, we can see it. And we can understand it. And we can discover knowledge for ourselves. And in a sense, that's the battle over freedom. It's a battle over the human mind. It's a battle over the idea of whether you control your life, but also whether you can know the world out there. It's not an accident, therefore, that this idea of political freedom, political liberty, comes out of an age called the age of reason, comes out of the Enlightenment, comes out of a period in which, in Europe, they rediscover the idea of reason, the efficaciousness of reason, a, a ability to discover the world. It's not an accident that that period, the age of reason, the enlightenment, is also known as the age of science. Newton and what follows in all the scientific discoveries that happened during the 18th and 19th century. So we want to be free or should want to be free because we want to be able to use our own mind our own judgment, to pursue our own values so that we as individuals can be happy. So underlying this idea of rights and this idea of political freedom are really two concepts, the efficacy of reason and individualism, the sanctity of the individual, the value of an individual, the fact that individual life matters. Indeed, it's all that matters in a sense, politically. So individualism and reason, individuals using their reason in pursuit of their values, in pursuit ultimately of their happiness. That's what we want freedom for. We want freedom so we can pursue our happiness. We want freedom so we can use our own judgment to pursue happiness, not be told what happiness is, not be told what actions to take, not be told what values to pursue, but choose them for ourselves. Now, that is kind of the philosophical context for the idea of freedom. And to realize that, to make it real politically, we need something that bridges these moral ideas about the sanctity of the individual, these epistemological ideas, which are about uh, the efficacy of reason, and the political idea of liberty. And that's what individual rights, that's the, uh, the purpose of this concept of individual rights. It's a bridging concept between the idea of individualism, in the idea of the sanctity of the individual, the idea of the pursuit of happiness, and the idea of freedom. What do individual rights say? What do they mean? What are 
individual rights. And, and really, individual rights, again, come out of the writing primarily, as we understand them, of, of John Locke, uh, the, the uh, British philosopher in the uh, 18th century, early 18th century, but they're really the predecessors uh, in other uh, thinkers in, uh, in Europe uh, during the previous uh, 50 to 100 years. But the idea of individual rights is the idea that you as an individual are valuable, and therefore you as an individual are an end in yourself, and therefore you should have the freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom means what? Means the absence of force, the absence of coercion, the absence of an authority telling you what you can and cannot do. So you as an individual should have the freedom to use your mind in pursuit of your values. That's what individual rights mean. It means that the government, the authority, the, the, the governing body must leave you alone to live your life as you see fit. It should only intervene to protect your rights. So the purpose of government, according to Rand, according to this kind of line of thought, is the purpose of government is only to protect your freedom, to protect your rights, to protect your ability to act on your own behalf, to act in your own interest, to act in pursuit of your own happiness. But otherwise, leave you alone. And that's why, you know, in, in the American Declaration of Independence, they say, you know, uh, we'll all have an inalienable right to life, which means to live our life as we see fit, based on our judgment, our mind, in pursuit of our values, liberty, which means we can think, we can talk, we can write, free of coercion, free of force. Unfortunately, they left out property. In the original, there was property there as well. But that is, we can keep the product of our labor. We can keep what we earn. It's ours. That's what property means. It's the, it's the ability to earn and to keep what you earn and pursue your happiness, which is the ultimate goal of all of this. Right? And that is what government is constituted to protect. Not to give you, not to define, but to protect. And that's what we have a constitution, is to create a government that's sole purpose is the protection of that. I think, I think the Japanese constitution has the pursuit of happiness in it. It was the goal of, of, uh, of government. I think uh, General MacArthur put it in there. Um, so individual rights are this concept to protect the individual from other individuals, but importantly to protect the individuals from the authorities, from government. It's to limit the scope of government, recognizing our individual liberty, our individual freedom, our individual rights to live our lives as we see fit. Now, as I think we all know, no government in the world has ever practiced this kind of limitation completely. Different governments violate our rights in different ways. All governments violate our rights to some extent, whether it's through coercion, of, uh, through uh, taxation, or whether it's through, um, I don't know, mask mandates, or whether it's through other types of mandates, we're mandated all over the place, whether it's through the regulation of business, uh, what kind of business you're allowed to open, how you open it, what kind of permissions you need in order to do whatever it is that you need to do. All of those are acts of coercion, acts of force that constrain our liberty. In the name always of what? What's the, what's, what's the purpose? Why do they do this? In the name of what? Yeah, in the name of protecting you or protecting what they call the common good, the public interest, which is a way of negating you as an individual because it's for, it's, it, you know, so one of two alternatives they have. One is to argue that it's good for you and you don't know what's good for you, which is a return to the platonic attitude of we know what's good for you. We're the philosopher kings. We understand. So we're going to impose this on you because it's good for you. That's one way in which they justify. And the second way to justify it is we know it's not good for you, but it doesn't matter what's it's good.
for the group. And then they negate the concept of individualism. Note that they always negate one of two. Either they negate your reason or they negate your individual, individualism, the value of you as an individual, in order to use coercion against you. All governments do that to some degree or another. But some governments do it more. <laughs> and some governments do it much more. And there is a real difference between governments that are like what we saw in the pictures and between what most of our governments, Japanese government, American governments, and so on, do. Now, it's to some extent an issue of degree, but there is a fundamental difference between the two. Because most of our societies or Western societies, what we call Western societies, and I include Japan as a Western society in that, in that sense, are societies that we still view as free. We're not as free as we'd like them to be. We're not as free as I think they should be. There's still way too much coercion, way too much many mandates, way too much government controls and government regulations and government's telling us what to do. So what characterizes, what is the difference fundamentally between a regime like China or even worse, North Korea, and something like the United States and uh, Japan? I think there are a few things that are clear markers that make a significant difference. Right? One is, and maybe in a sense the most important one, is the issue of freedom of speech. Can you speak? Can you argue? Can you debate? Can you make your voice heard? See, yes, there's coercion imposed, but can I stand up and say, this is wrong? And here are the arguments, and here's my reasons, and hey, I'm trying to convince people that this is wrong so we can do something about it. Do you have that ability? That is a marker of a relatively free society, that you can do that. We can still do that in the United States. You can still do that in Japan. You can still do that in many countries around the world. But you can't do it in China. And you can do it in China today less than you could five years ago or 10 years ago. That is the direction China's heading is clearly away from free speech. So I remember being in China 10 years ago and being able to say all kinds of things about freedom and liberty and uh, the, the, why the Chinese government was wrong and why uh, you know, the, the, the way they were running things was wrong. And already, just before COVID in 2019, you could say a little bit less, or you could say it, but now people were hesitant to come, and hesitant to listen, and hesitant to debate, and today I wouldn't go. Right. So we've seen a slow decline in, China, in, in, in freedom of speech, but you see it also today in the United States. Right. You see this decline in the ability to have this debate. It's not yet at the point where the government is imposing it, but there's a shift in the culture. We become a culture that doesn't want to debate certain things, that certain things are unacceptable to talk about, that you can't say. Certain speakers are, are not permitted to speak at universities. Now, the universities can choose who they want to have speak and who they don't want to have speak. It's within their rights. So it's not a rights violation, but it's a cultural attitude that is against the idea of speaking, debating, arguing, using reason to solve issues. And again, this is in America. It's, I mean, we mostly hear about woke. We mostly hear about the problems on the left. But there are similar problems on the right. It is a culture-wide phenomenon. They just have different topics that you can't talk about. There's different, different issues that are unacceptable to both left and right. So freedom of speech is a right, is part of those right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. This is the heart of liberty is the ability to speak, is to argue ideas, to convince people, to try to reason with them, to try to change their mind, to try to move them along in your direction. The second characteristic of a, uh, a free society is that you don't have, and it's related, I think, to free speech, is that you don't have political prisoners. You put people in jail for real crimes, which means when they violate somebody else's rights, 
when they use force against somebody, when they use fraud against somebody, when they really violate, you don't put people in jail for their ideas, their political actions, their political points of view, what they wrote, what they did. Again, for the most part, our countries don't have political prisoners. We put a lot of people in jail for things that are not necessarily violating somebody else's rights. We can talk about that if you want, but we don't put them in jail yet for their political activity. We don't use the government to try to determine, to try to screen out unacceptable people from a political perspective. Right? Again, the tide is turning, I think, a little bit in the West about this, and we have to be cautious. But at least we don't do that. China, clearly they do. Clearly they have political prisoners. And in every regime that is an authoritarian regime, what you find are people placed in jail for their points of view about the government. China, uh, Russia is a good example. Um, not only in Russia are they being put in jail, but you know, there's this phenomena of Russians falling out of windows. I don't know if you've heard about this, but uh, every week, some Russian official, usually from the oil and gas industry, dies, and often they're dying by dropping out of a window. Suicide, you know, um, uh, you know they're depressed. Accidents, suddenly a lot of Russians are slipping and falling from high places. It, it's very strange. Uh, but just, uh, just on the flight here, I read of another uh, uh, minor oligarch, I guess, who, who uh, has died. Um, so you could kill your opponents, political opponents, you could put them in jail, but one way or another, your political opponents are being silenced. So Russia technically is a, quote, democracy, right? They vote. But if you can kill all your political opponents, then, yeah, you're the only man standing. Voting doesn't matter. Remember the, the poisoning? Right? They, they, they've tried to assassinate through poisoning, through, uh, they, they've used uh, um, radioactive material to poison people. Uh, so Russia is, is well known as a regime that has eliminated its political opponents. And that's, that's when you know you're not free. When, if you have a particular point of view, you risk being, um, being assassinated. Of, of all the countries I've visited, I've, I've given speeches in, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 countries. Um, the country where I felt the most constrained, the most a little fearful was Russia. I mean, China it was, in, in, again, 2019 and before, no problem. Could say anything, and the audience was very open, and there was a lot of debate and discussion. Russia, it was very cold, partially because the people there are a little colder. Chinese are very friendly and vivacious people, generally. Uh, the Russians are very close, but partially, I said it, it, you know, I said this years ago, I think probably in 2015 or 2016, somebody asked me something about Putin at a talk I gave, and I said, you know, he's a, he's a thug, he's a gangster, and everybody in the audience kind of went, you can't say that, you know, you have to, what are you doing? <laughs> well, don't ask me if you don't want to hear my answer, right? That's <laughs> but so Russia is, is very much on this authoritarian line. Uh, Iran, uh, obviously North Korea. You can tell the regimes in which this is happening. Turkey is, you know, kind of in a gray area, but certainly some political uh, opponents have been put in jail. Um, and, uh, but you still don't get that, right? You don't get that in most of Europe. You don't get that in, in, in uh, you know, South Korea, here, Taiwan. Um, and uh, I was going to say Hong Kong, but can't say Hong Kong anymore, right? So that's two, the th and, and, they, and, and, and they're highly related. And the third is uh, the fact that we have elections, the fact that we can choose our political leaders. Now, many, many of us argue that there's not much of a choice when you have to choose between Biden and Trump. I mean, um, but you still get to choose, you get to argue, you get to uh, run yourself, you get to start a new political party, you get, to, you get to be engaged in a political process, you get to have some kind of say in what's going on in the country. Uh, 
you can get people excited and get people to change their minds. It's happened. You know, you know one of the, one of the uh, um, you know, great examples in the United States is kind of the abolitionist movement, the movement to abolish slavery in the 19th century. I mean, they changed people's minds. The slavery was very much entrenched in the United States in the early 19th century. And during the first half of the 19th century, leading up to the Civil War, people's minds were changed by people advocating for this group, you know, women's right to vote. That was a change that people brought about through a process of arguing and deliberating and ultimately bringing about political force, political power, right? And that happened in country after country after country all over Europe and America and spreading out in the rest of the world. So the fact that we can really, truly influence the political process. Right? Not maybe as individuals, but at least we can get together as groups and, and, and have an impact. So those would be the three criteria for the difference between a free country and an oppressive country. Now, why should we care about the fact that somewhere else there is an authoritarian regime? Why should we care about uh, you know, uh, uh, Putin's thuggery and China's oppression of its own people, uh, its violation of their rights. Clearly, they are using force to dictate how people should live, what they can say, what they can think, what they can do, how they should live. And, and you know, in China, it used to be that at least in, econ in business, they would leave you alone. You know, maybe you'd have to bribe the right people, but once you bribe the right people, they'd leave you alone. And that's changed in the last few years. We saw that. Uh, with Jack Ma, and, and he, said something, he said something negative about uh, the Chinese central bank and their policies or the Chinese treasury, and suddenly he was silenced and, and shunned away, and the value of his companies tanked. And since then, we've seen more regulations and more controls over businesses and over even in the technology space where the Chinese had before pretty much left it alone. But why should we care about any of this, right? Why should we care about what happens in faraway countries uh, what they're doing is they're doing it to their own people. Um, so, you know, we've got enough problems where we are. There's enough battles, uh, you know, uh, to political battles here in Japan. Uh, there are enough political battles in the United States. Why should we worry or care about these other regimes? It's just their own people. Let's think, at, you know, at least two reasons. One is you care because we're human beings and we care about other human beings. We know what value human beings can represent for us. Right? We know how much they can contribute to our life. So, you know, China, for example, just from an economic perspective, put aside anything else, China's made my life a lot better over the last 30 years. And any American who's honest, I think it's true of Japanese as well, but certainly with Americans, because we're so anti-China these days, any American who's honest would say, China, Chinese production, Chinese productivity, Chinese... Um, uh, you know, work ethic, their ability to produce has benefited us significantly. It's made the cost of goods lower. It's raised our standard of living. It's freed up capital for us to invest in other things. It is, uh, it's unimaginable. The, the global economy over the last 30 years, it's unimaginable what it would look like without what's happened in China over the last 30 years. We would be so much poorer. And I know this goes against the grain of so much of the thought out there, but it's just economic fact. The, you know, uh, uh, the, the division of labor globally, globalization, has been a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, economic, a, a phenomenal economic uh, fact that has benefited all of us. It's made life easier, better, cheaper, more fulfilling. And it's, we don't appreciate it because the differences are small and they accumulate. So every year, your standard of living goes up a little bit, but it's incremental, it's small. But, you know, I know because some of you don't even remember life before the iPhone, because there was no life before the iPhone, because you were born around, you know. But, and I remember, vaguely I remember life before the iPhone. And now I complain about my iPhone all the time, right? But when I actually sit down and think 
about all the value the iPhone has added to my life. It's unbelievable. It's fantastic, right? I, 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 you know, there's so many ways, I, I could give a whole talk just on the iPhone, but there's so many ways in which this is true, right? I remember when I moved to the, United, to, to the U.S. in 1987, um, all my family was left in Israel. I would never call them. You know, maybe once every three, four months I would call because it was super expensive, right? And it wasn't, they didn't have the money, I didn't have, so, so you, you never communicated. Now I, I can video conference and, and tell my kids a bed night story every night, and it costs me exactly zero. I mean, just that. Think about that in terms of how it makes travel possible, right? I, I remember, we were just talking about this, I remember driving around a foreign city, not knowing anything, trying to read a map and read the signs, and it's shocking to me that traffic accidents were, weren't 10 times higher than they are today, right? It, with everybody was driving with maps. Now you plug in the GPS, you put in the thing, no matter where you are in the world, you can go from point A to point B in the most efficient, direct way possible and safe. I mean, just little things like that, but it's little so we don't notice them. So when we get to using an iPhone to do the GPS, well, we complain because it doesn't always take us to exactly the right place. But the difference is huge we just don't remember that difference, and we don't appreciate it. But all of this has been made possible by the productive ability of the Chinese. And it's not something you should be taking for granted, because a lot of countries have not achieved that. Right? They did it. So we care because other human beings around the world are value to us. They make stuff. They make our lives better. To the extent that they produce, to the extent that they create anything, it's better for us. Trade is a win-win, right? When you buy an iPhone, right? Pay $1,000 for this. You pay $1,000 because you believe, at least, that it's going to be worth more than $1,000 to you. So I win when I buy an iPhone. It's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to me. Don't tell Apple. And Apple wins. They make a profit. And all trade is win-win. I mean, unless there's fraud, unless we're cheating one another, but 99.9999% of trade is upfront and no fraud and win-win. So we value other people because they're potential trading partners for us, both spiritually and materially. And we care about what happens to them. And as China declines, my standard of living is gonna decline. That's just the reality. If we stop trading, standard of living goes down. But there's a second reason we should care. And we're seeing that, I think, in Russia today. When dictators and authoritarians are used to violating the rights of their own citizens, used to using violence of their own people, then they have no compunction, they have no problem then using violence against other people. Once they are free to do it internally, why not do it externally? Indeed, it's almost a prerequisite. Because one thing is true of authoritarian regimes. They all fail. They're all losers. All of them. They don't succeed. If you go back over the 20th century, and you look at all the authoritarian regimes in the 20th century, they all failed. They failed their own people, and ultimately they failed themselves. And, you know, there's so many myths about authoritarians. You know, they're, they're, they're so charismatic, right? I don't know, Hitler and Stalin who had this charisma. People just flocked to them. Well, if people just flock to you, why do you have to use force against them? Why do you have to restrict what they say? If people love you so much, if people are so enamored with you, why do you have to limit their speech and limit their opposition? No. I mean, you are the enemy of the people you are in supposedly inspiring. And to some extent, they know it. And your only way to control them is by silencing them and by using force against them. And that never works. It always fails. So Hitler failed. Stalin failed. Failed. Not only did he starve his own people, but ultimately communism collapsed. 
Mao failed. Authoritarianism does not succeed. It can last for a while, depending on the circumstances, but ultimately it has to fail. And when it fails internally, when it fails for your own people, then the impulse is to go out and start a war, to go out and seek a distraction. Now, I don't think this is what Putin is doing. I think Putin is a believer. He believes in some kind of mythology of a Russian empire. He believes in some kind of destiny of the Russian people as great people and the, the control, you know, control the world. If you, you know, if you want to understand uh, some of what drives uh, Putin, you should listen to uh, Dugin, uh, his, uh, his, uh, one of his many, I think, uh, Russian nationalist philosophers, and they have this notion of, 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 a, of a, a, a Russian spirit and a Russian destiny and a Russian place in history, uh, which they get out of thin air. You know, it doesn't exist. There's nothing, there's nothing real about it. But they've made up this mythology. Um, and, and Putin wants more land. He wants more influence. He wants more power. Uh, so if he's willing to oppress his own people, if he's willing to use force against his own people, if he's willing to throw people out of windows, and what's a few tens or hundreds of thousands or millions of Ukrainians to him? Doesn't matter. He's willing to bomb cities. He's willing to kill as many people as necessary in order to get his way. So we should care because these two things are happening. We're losing trading partners. We're losing the ability to enjoy the benefits that we get from these amazing people out there, right? And we are risking that the regimes who are authoritarian will lash out with war and destruction and, uh, and actually hurt us physically. So not just hurt us by taking away the potential traders, trading partners, but actually hurt us physically uh, through, through warfare. And I think that's the situation which we have today in, um, uh, in, in, in the Pacific. Right? You know, North Korea is not a big threat, primarily because it is weak, it is poor, it doesn't have the capacities to really threaten anybody. Yes, it has nukes, but do we, you know, do we know that they'll go off? The, you know, the, the chance that they would actually work is very low, and the chance that they're willing to commit suicide in order to do something like that is very low. But short of nuclear weapons, they have nothing. They have no capacity to hurt us. I think one of the, one of the things I hope that the war in Russia will teach us, right? because, because I do think we're, we're, we're learning important lessons in Russia right now, and that is that not only authoritarian governments are uh, weak and destructive internally, but ultimately they lose militarily. Uh, you know, Russian weapon systems are terrible. They're really, really, really bad. They've always been really, really, really bad. Why? Because before Russia, it was the Soviets building them. Communists were building them. How good could they be? Remember the cars that the Soviets built? I don't know if anybody remembers. The, the, they built automobiles. They were horrible. Nobody would buy an automobile built by the communists. Why would you buy a tank built by the communists? It's the same thing. The quality is awful. The last thing that they think about is the soldier, because the soldier doesn't matter. So uh, most of the weapon systems that the Russians built are death traps for their own soldiers. So I, I, I have a little bit of first-hand experience with this, because uh, I, was, I was in a war in 1982 where we fought against um, uh, Russian equipment, right? uh, T-72s. I remember T-72s, because I was for, for a short while I was in the tank corps in Israel, and, um, and we were trained to fight T-72s. And we were really afraid because everybody told us T-72 is the most sophisticated tank in the world. It's got this low profile. You can't hit it. It's, it's only got three crew members instead of the usual four because it's got an automatic loading machine so it can fire faster, so it's more efficient. We were terrified of the T-72s. 
And then in 1982, we went to war, uh, you know, and we, 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 the Syrians had T-72s, and we discovered that they were, they were awful tanks. You didn't have to hit them. You, 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 you exploded anything close to T-72. The vibration would take the automatic load here out of sync, and the tank wouldn't function, so the crew would get out and run. So Israel actually captured a couple of completely functioning T-72s. They handed them to Americans who you got because no, nobody had ever seen one from the inside, right? And, and that's the kind of thinking that, you, you know, hope, I assume that they've improved the T-72 things but, since, but, for example, Israeli tanks always had this layer of protection for the crew. So I don't know if you know how they, these layers work, but they're, they're, really, they're really kind of cool. It's like an armor that surrounds the tank, and the armor is, has explosives in it. So when the external explosive hits, there's an internal explosion that happens at, at the surface that dissipates the force of the missile that hit so that the projectile doesn't enter the tank and kill everybody inside. And it's primarily, it might decapitate the tank. The tank might not work anymore, but it saves the crew. Russians don't, I mean, some of their modern tanks have it, but they never used to have it, and not all of them have it. Why? Because they don't care that much about the crew. They don't care about the individual. They don't care about their people. So one thing I think we're learning from the war in Russia, which we should have known, is that the soldiers are not motivated. The weapons are not good. They're not well trained. They don't have good strategy. They're not good at producing. They're not good pretty much at anything. That's what authoritarian regimes lead to. Now, Chinese are probably better, but probably not great. It's not clear that Chinese soldiers are motivated or that their equipment is that much more advanced than the Russian equipment on which it is based. A lot of the Chinese weapon systems are based on Russian weapon systems. So there's a certain incompetence in authoritarian regimes' ability to wage war. And I'm hoping that the world learns both of their incompetence, but also I'm hoping China is looking at Russia and saying, huh, maybe those weapon systems are better. Maybe taking Taiwan won't be so easy. Maybe going to war isn't a good idea. And certainly I think the North Koreans are looking because their army, all they have is people. Now, it's cannon fodder. They don't mind losing millions of people, but they don't have the capacity to wage war against South Korea. So one of the things I'm hoping that free countries learn from this is that if we invest in, the mili in, in our military capabilities and if we're confident in our abilities, we really don't have that much to fear. You know, unless, of course, it's a nuclear situation where we, we have the capacity to deal with any one of these authoritarian governments fairly, I think, easily on a military scale. I think the bigger problem is kind of the, 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 the move towards isolation in the world today and the move towards, um, you know, the, these, these authoritarian regimes leaving kind of the global economy, which is going to have real significant economic consequences uh, on all of our lives, on everybody around the world. But it's their choices which, which are hard for us to control. Now, let me just say something about kind of international relations from a kind of an Ayn Rand perspective, although what I'm going to say now is my views, not Ayn Rand's views. So it's kind of, uh, so I don't know if she'd agree with me or not. Who knows? Um, but, but this is relates to how one should deal with these countries, right? So what should Japan's governments and Japanese citizens' attitudes, let's say, towards China should be? And I would say... The way to think about the world is to categorize it into three kinds of countries, three, kind, three different kinds of countries. One are free countries, or basically free countries. As I said, no country is completely free, but basically free countries. In a basically free country, you have diplomatic relations, you trade, you, you have the full scope of human interaction. And, you know, you have embassies and you have, uh, you, you maybe have treaties and you, you, you can form coalitions around certain issues, um, you know, kind of multilateral organizations that, that deal with particular issues. Because you're dealing with other countries 
that are free, that are like you, and that deal, we know, that deal with one another as rational beings, as you know, debate and discussion is valued. There's a second category, though, and that is the category of authoritarian governments out there in the world. But this is authoritarian governments who you don't deem to be your enemy. So they're not a threat to you. They're not attacking your citizens. They're not trying to steal your stuff. They're, they're basically um, doing it to their own people. They haven't yet moved to the stage of being, a, you know, a, a, of, of activities that, that are, that are uh, offensive. In that, those kind of regimes, I think that the government, the government of Japan, the government of the United States, should not have diplomatic relations with those regimes. So I don't think we should have an embassy in China. Because once you have diplomatic relations, you're sanctioning them. You're saying you're a legitimate player. We can talk. We're equals, right? I mean, one of the great travesties of the post-World War II era is the United Nations. It's a horrible institution. Where at the same desk, you had the, you know, the, the Security Council, that everybody where they have a veto. You have the United States, you have Stalin, and you have, well, and you have, by, in the 1970s, you have Mao Zedong as equals. So you have free countries and the most brutal authoritarian regimes in human history sitting as equals on the same table, debating freedom, debating war. I mean, these people don't know what freedom is, and they are warlike nations, that is, warlike regimes. So what are you talking about? There's nothing to talk about. So I don't believe you, there should be a United Nations that involves both free countries and authoritarian countries. I think there should be a clear demarcation. Authoritarian countries should be shunned from a diplomatic perspective. But as individuals, you should all be allowed to trade with them. You should be allowed to visit. You should be allowed, but with the risk, right? Because there's no embassy there anymore. So there's a certain risk, but that is a risk you have to internalize as an individual and deal with it, but you should buy their goods and trade, that's fine. Then there's a third category, and that is what I would consider enemy countries, countries that are physical threat. Clearly a country like North Korea is an enemy country, certainly to South Korea, maybe to Japan. I mean, they've, they pointed missiles in the direction of Japan and talked about being you know, an enemy of Japan. And then I think you should have no diplomatic relations but also, you should not be allowed to trade. Trade, remember, is win-win. You don't want to help the enemy. So you don't provide them with a win. So in that case, there is legitimate to embargo those countries. I don't believe in these silly sanctions. We sanctioned five oligarchs, but not those oligarchs, because those oligarchs give money to, you know. Um, I mean, it, it's interesting to see how governments are dealing with the oligarchs in Russia. Why these oligarchs and not those? Why does England sanction some and the United States sanction others and there's no, it's not the same? Why only the oligarchs? Well, what about all the other people who cooperate with the regime who are not rich, right? Why only the rich guys? It's, it's just a, it's, it's a and, and you know, they're confiscating yachts, they're confiscating property with no trial, no nothing, just some bureaucrat decides we want to, the whole regime. I mean, you either embargo a country and say, there's just no trade with this country. You can't have any dealings with this country. Because they're an enemy. And you don't want to benefit the enemy at all. And then it becomes tricky. You know, is China an authoritarian regime offending its own people and, and we can trade with them and all that? Or is it an enemy? Is it qualified as an enemy yet? I don't think so. But it's moving in that direction. So at some point it'll cross the line. And it'll get pretty tricky if it crosses that line. Right? So if you're in private business, you want to diversify away from China as quickly as possible. But so that's the way I think in a rational world, we would kind of divvy this up. We would look at how these governments are protecting or not protecting individual rights. If they're unfree in the sense that they're fundamentally violating individual rights, the government should have no business with those countries. You as individuals would then choose, so let's say China today, let's say it's not an enemy, but it's an authoritarian regime. We might all choose as individuals not to trade with China because we don't want to help what we saw, the pictures that we saw earlier 
of Chinese violating people's rights. We might not want to assist that. But the government should not have a say because the government is there to protect our rights. And if China is not violating our rights, government has no business one way or the other in China policy. It has no embassy. It has no official relationship with China. But other than that, leaves it alone. But then it's up to our own morality, our own choices in terms of what we're willing, who we're willing to deal with or not deal with. So one of the things lacking today in the world is really any kind of orientation towards moral judgment and a judgment of other countries and a judgment of other cultures and a judge, judgment of other political systems in terms of being right, wrong, good, bad. Everything is gray. There's no, you know, it's, it's, it's considered wrong to judge. Even in foreign policy, there's the realist school. We have to make all these calculations and evaluations. But you, you never make a, an actual judgment about whether they're good guys or bad guys. I think all of that is wrong, and it's a negation of this idea that we really started with, which is the value of the individual, the value of his rights, the value of his freedom. The way we should judge governments and countries and systems is based on the extent to which they respect the individual's right to live his life. And we should make it clear as individuals, as societies, as governments, we should make it clear our judgments of different regimes based on this criteria. I think it's the only criteria that matters politically because politics is there at the end of the day to protect us as individuals. That's its purpose. Uh, so we should encourage people to talk about rights. We should point out when rights are being violated. We should, um, uh, we should make a big deal out of governments violating their own citizens' rights. And once they cross that threshold from basically free to basically unfree, once freedom of speech, then our judgment of those regimes, our judgment of those countries needs to change dramatically. Uh, even China, I think, over the last 10 years has changed quite a bit. Right? It was at least in some realms free, in some realms, and then it's drifting, and our evaluation of it needs to change significantly as those countries changed. And we should demand of our governments to take a much harsher, much stronger position in defending freedom and liberty. Freedom and liberty are not something we should be taking for granted. It's something we need to continuously, forever, fight over. We have to be vigilant about preserving it Otherwise, if we're indifferent when it disappears in other countries, we risk being indifferent when it disappears in our own country. All right, thank you. For the objective and way of views. Our next is a question and session. あ、あ、でしょ。で、それでは、え、質問は、え、日本語でも英語でも大丈夫です。で、ここからは30年前から、え、アイルランドを読んでおられ、え、オブジェクティビズムのセミナーを多数開催されている田村洋一さんが日本
more importantly, do you think that that's the like eschatological end of human beings? Like, is it the end of society? Uh, like, is it the end of the story? Like, uh, end of fish, to, yeah, to yeah, quote like Fukuyama. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's not a philosophical question. How long? It's a prophecy. I'm not a prophet. Um, I, I think it's going to take a long time. Uh, I don't think the world's heading in the right direction today. I think we're heading in the wrong direction. I think we're heading towards more authoritarianism, particularly in the United States and in Europe. Um, so I, 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 think, I think all the trends are going against us achieving this. Again, I think freedom and liberty are an achievement. They take education, they take ideas, they take a right philosophy, and that takes time. Um, and so, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years, well, all countries, you said all countries, I, you know, I don't know, 100, 200 years, who knows. I mean, it would be nice if there were one, right? Because we could all go there. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll settle for one. Um, one, I, I'm hoping 50 years. Is it the end of history, if the whole world? Um, there's a sense in which it might be, right? In a sense that conflict go away. If history is this story of conflict, then, it, then, then, then it's the end of that. You know, but again, given that freedom is an achievement, even, when it's, even if when it's achieved, will it be sustained everywhere? Every country will sustain it. Equal, you know, and, and there won't be anybody who backtracks and becomes aggressive and does a, who knows, right? So I doubt that even from the perspective of great conflict that it just goes away completely, right? Just like in a free society where everybody is supposed to be rational or everybody's embraced rationality as the means and, and you're teaching the kids, and it, are there going to be any criminals? Sure, there's still going to be crooks. There's still going to be people making that choice in life. So I, I don't think you ever have the end of history in that sense. But there's another sense in which I think viewing history as just conflict is wrong. Because on the contrary, if, that, if we achieve a state of, of real political freedom, then that's just the beginning. <laughs> I mean, imagine the progress that we will make as, a, as, as human beings. Imagine the achievements that are going to be, uh, they're going to be uh, uh, achieved, the, the products that are going to be produced, the, stars, you know, the planets that we will uh, inhabit, uh, uh, you know, it's just, it's just the beginning. It's the beginning of, uh, you know, massive human advance. So in that sense, history, no. I mean, uh, it's, it's a mistake to think, I mean, in school, all we study in school is great battles and great political politicians and things like that. But that's not what's interesting. I mean, the only thing, there's a sense in which the only thing that's interesting in history is the last 250 years, in a sense. There's, there's, a, there's a sense where it's completely wrong, but there's a sense in which that, right? And that is, everything that we have today is a product of the last 250 years, materially at least. There was nothing before that, almost nothing. Slight advancements every thousand, you know, every hundred years, they made a little bit more of an, an advancement, advancement, and then suddenly everything takes off. That's what's interesting in history. And, but they, you never teach that. Nobody teaches the Industrial Revolution as this amazing period in which humanity suddenly discovers the ability to, to, to produce and create and change its environment so that humanity can grow to be 8 billion people without starvation and without destruction and live successfully. Nobody teaches that, right? You learn the battles, Napoleon did that. But Napoleon, in the big scheme of things, not that important. The guy who invented the steam engine, much more important. The, the, the first thing, you know, John J.D. Rockefeller, who figures out how to make oil into something we can use and makes the process more and more and more efficient, a thousand times more important than any politician who lived in the 19th century. You're never going to, nobody's going to teach you that. The scientists are important. The businessmen are important. Politicians. Yeah. Um, you know, my caveat to that is, of course, spiritually, the values go way back, right? So arts, aesthetics, that you know, in a sense, we, you, there's a sense in which we peaked 2,500 years ago in Greece and then descended and, and only came back in the Renaissance and, and uh, developed since then. And now we're, I don't know where we are, in, in, in deep in the, in the bowels of hell. 
uh, when it comes to aesthetics and arts. But, um, so, so there's a sense in which human history is important, but even then, do you, do you learn art history? No. Do you learn art history from that perspective, from perspective of human achievement and the value it has for human beings? No, we don't learn that. We learn all the battles and all the politicians, and all, which is the less interesting part of human history, less important part of human history. Thank you very much. Well, uh, the, I, looking at the current uh, world situation, well, unfortunately, Japan is surrounded by three gangsters, such as China, or North Korea, Russia. But uh, even though we're not happy with those countries, and um, just uh, if you look at the, uh, those countries' situation, you just mentioned uh, the Jack markets, and uh, previously uh, maybe Chanto Chanto means era or Hotindal era, but uh, maybe uh, still economy is superior to the uh, CCP, I mean Communist Party. Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, maybe still the Communist Party they tried to everything, but on the other hand, they consider they had to consider about the human level, um, life level. So in case of that, uh, maybe still it's a kind of a rule to negotiate or talk talk with them. But currently, in Xi Jinping, what that he did is the politics try to control the uh, people's economic activities. That is what you mentioned. I mean, this is my understanding. Yep. But however, uh, the, in free countries such as Japan, United States, or Europe, um, those countries, uh, of course, uh, they, in case of China, maybe uh, the genocide conducted by the Communist Party against the Uyghur or Tibetan or yep. Mongolian. Yep. And uh, some people are uh, started to criticize what they're doing. And then some people think about maybe still they need to give the kind of pressure against those countries. But on the other hand, businessmen or business field or business sectors or, uh, stop it. Because China is a big market. Yeah. Russia it supplies the energy. Yeah. So even though we give the big I mean um, big issues Get those countries, um, the, but uh, what we are doing is we can, uh, I mean, obviously give the kind of the uh, strong pressure against those countries. Even though Europe, uh, those EU, EU uh, criticize what Russia is doing, but they need energy yeah. from Russia. Yeah. And in case of Japan or many the U.S. Uh, businessmen as well. And uh, <clears throat> people can think about it, the China is still the big, biggest market. And if we cut off the, those re, I mean, economical relationships, maybe we have to uh, I mean, survive in a um, very I mean, serious, critical situation. Sure. So what, what is your viewpoint? So uh, let me just say about uh, Russia and Europe first. Um, Europe crippled itself. Europe doesn't have to be reliant on Russia. Europe cr it, it created the reliance on Russia. And it created the reliance on Russia knowing Putin, knowing who he was. Remember, this is not the first war Putin is engaged in. I think it was 2008 that he invaded Georgia and basically took two provinces in Georgia and uh, it, you know, made them independent. Uh, but the parts of Georgia um, in 2014, uh, you know, he's fought two wars with the Chechens, brutal wars in Chechnya, um, uh, two wars because they tried to cede from Russia. They tried to establish their own Chechen Republic. And, you know, he just crushed them and destroyed whole cities and flattened all places. And, of course, in 2014, he invaded Ukraine. And in spite of all of that history and in spite of Putin's character and the way he oppresses his own people, the Europeans have become more and more and more dependent on Russian, oil, uh, Russian gas, which is not necessary. <laughs> you know, so, so, for example, um, Britain, the United Kingdom, they have natural gas. If they allowed fracking, they could get natural gas. They wouldn't need to, to instead of investing in fracking, which is very cheap, very easy to do, they invested in windmills 
in the uh, in the north, you know, in the in, in, in the ocean, which is very expensive, very dangerous, very risky, and not very reliable. And and the funniest one, I, I mean, Germany has invested huge amounts of money in solar panels. I mean, have you ever been to Germany? There's no sun. <laughs> I mean, it's not Texas. It, it's, it's Germany, it's middle of Europe, it's cloudy. And yet they've invested huge amounts of money in solar panels. So uh, Germany used to have lots of energy capacity from nuclear. They've shut most of it down. They were going to shut down the last three nuclear power plants and now they brought it back. Japan, I understand, is bringing back its nuclear uh, energy, which is good. You should be investing in new nuclear plants because your old ones, as we saw in Fukuyama, are not very good. So we should be investing in technologies that actually work instead of in solar panels and in wind and all of this that gives power to, um, uh, to the Putins of the world or even to the, to the Saudi Arabia of the world. I'm not happy about the fact that the Saudis have as much power as they do. And, and they have as much power as they do, partially because they stole the oil that was developed by Western countries, but, but then also because we don't develop our own resources. The United States is different because they allowed for fracking. So we, they discovered fracking and then they let it loose. You know? And one of the reasons the United States is struggling a little bit now is because Biden, when he came in, said, He's launching a war on fossil fuels. So nobody's going to invest in fossil fuels if the president says there's a war on fossil fuels. So investment went down and they weren't ready for the crisis. But we are, are, are you know, chopping our own legs off. We are weakening ourselves. So we need to make sure that we're not dependent on authoritarian regimes. We should have done that a long time ago with the Middle East. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, but we didn't. We should, have, we should have not allowed Saudi Arabia to control all the oil and uh, the Gulf uh, countries to control all the oil, but we allowed them to do that. Uh, we shouldn't allow the Russians to have a monopoly over natural gas into Europe, and I hope Europe's learning a lesson, and they're building LNG facilities, and now they're, they're, they're gonna import uh, natural gas from Israel and Egypt. Uh, and from Oman and from other places, from different places. So hopefully they'll diversify and hopefully they can cut Russia off. So uh, that's the idea. Now China is more difficult. And China is more difficult because, again, we made certain assumptions about China, which are wrong now, have turned out to be wrong. Now maybe they'll still be okay, but so far they seem to be moving in the wrong direction, right? That is, we made the assumption that as the, because in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, the Chinese economy was a relatively free economy. Uh, you know, some American businessmen argued that, it was, that China was less regulated than America. It was easier to do business in China than America. And it was true. But it was always kind of dependent on whether the government wanted you or not, because they don't protect rights. See, in America, if the government does something horrible to your business, suddenly changes its mind and does, then you can, you can go to court, you can say well, you're violating this and that, you know, you can do something. When in China, the, the, the leadership can change and everything changes. And Jack Ma goes to jail and everything, everything shifts, right? And you have no mechanism by which to try to redress it, to try to, to fix it. But the assumption was that that economic freedom would grow that the middle, Chinese middle class would get wealthier and then start demanding political freedom. And that ultimately China would move in a direction of political freedom, not political oppression. And if you look back, it's easy now to say that was a big mistake. But it looked very promising until about 2013, maybe 2015, it looked very promising. Uh, the, the economic liberty there, but there was also some openness in terms of free speech. There were opposition, there were opposition figures. Yes, they might have been followed by the secret police and stuff like that, but generally they were left alone and they could do, books were published. I mean, all of Ayn Rand's books are in Chinese, selling in Chinese bookstores. Even as in 2020, my book, the, the title is Equal is Unfair, was published in China, which just proves that China's not communist, right? It's, 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 it's fascist, it's not communist. Right? Um, 
And it's still selling, as far as I know, it's still selling in China and Chinese bookstores, right? So uh, China looked like it was heading in the right direction and, and people invested in it, but now it's not. So the first thing that has to happen is businessmen need to be, to think long-term. And it's hard, but they need to think long-term. Businessmen are good at thinking long-term. I think much better than politicians are thinking long-term. But they need to think long-term. And, and you're seeing a little bit of this, right? You're seeing Apple start moving production to Vietnam and to India. And you're seeing other countries. And what businessmen need to start doing is to diversify out of China. Uh, uh, you know, uh, not slowly, fast. And they need to start building production in other places. Now, China has other problems, which businessmen should care about, right? And the biggest problem China has, I mean, the, the, the two big problems China has. One is the more the government intervenes in the economy, the worse the economy is going to do, the, the less money consumers will have to spend, the less of an interesting market it becomes. So the more government intervention, the worse things will be in China. So the economy already is collapsing. There's a real estate collapse in China right now. Um, I mean, China's economy is probably shrinking. Right? And the second problem, which will make that shrinking even more significant, is a demographic problem. China peaked in population probably five years ago. And it's shrinking. And it's shrinking fast. It's shrinking faster than Japan or, or South Korea, which are already shrinking pretty fast. China has the potential, because of the one-child policy, uh, to truly collapse demographically. You know, by some estimates, within 15 years, they could be at half the population of what they were at their peak. They could be down to six to 700 million from 1.4 billion, which is what they peaked at, right? Now, that's huge. So as a business person, you have to think about what does that mean politically in China? What does that mean consumer-wise in China? Are they going to be workers? One of the reasons everybody went to China is because, you know, Silicon Valley friends of mine told me, the reason we went to China is not because of cheap labor. The reason we went to China is because if, if we needed a thousand engineers tomorrow, in China you could hire a thousand engineers tomorrow. And in the United States you can't, you just don't have engineers. <laughs> China had millions of engineers that could be hired into. So, but are they going to be millions of engineers in the future? If, if every generation is smaller, if young people who are the engineers of the future, if that, then where are you going to, why go to China? So for a variety of reasons, businesses should be looking to diversify out of China and be looking, looking at other countries and other places. Um, so that should be the first step. And as business does that, I think governments need to put more and more pressure on the Chinese. Now, pressure on the Chinese doesn't mean tariffs. Tariffs is the dumbest, stupidest policy one can imagine, right? Because all you're doing when you place tariffs is taxing your own people. And you're not, you're not changing anything. You're not changing the dynamics. Indeed, uh, you know, since Trump's tariffs on Chinese goods, we have a larger trade deficit with China than we did before. Uh, currency values adjust. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't make any economic sense. So what you want to do is, I mean, one thing the West could do and should do is use what's called the bully pulpit. Use the stage to make, to morally condemn the Chinese government. I mean, one of the greatest, one of the great travesties of the 21st century, of, which is a young century, but still, um, is the fact that China took Hong Kong and nobody said anything. It was quiet. I don't know if the Japanese government objected, but the American government, Trump said nothing. Zero. The British government said something one week. The Chinese were offended, so they, they stopped. Right. Uh, politicians need to stand up and, and, and instead of condemning trade, which is a good thing, condemn Chinese actions like in China. And just that condemnation. Just the words mean a lot. You know, one of the strengths of Ronald Reagan when he was president was what he said. He didn't do much. In that sense, he wasn't a great president, but what he said. So, for example, if you talk to Lech Walesa, Lech Walesa is the guy who, um, who was the head of the union that started the strikes in Poland, that started, in a sense, you could argue, started 
what ultimately led to the fall of the Berlin Wall. He said, Reagan standing up to the Russians, calling them the evil empire, uh, tear down this wall, things like that, gave them moral courage inside Eastern Europe to stand up and face the communism. Moral courage. If our politicians said to the Russian, to, to, no, this is wrong, this is evil, you should stop doing this, you are bad guys, stop it. It would make a difference. It would make a difference to the better people within China who might ultimately rise up and challenge this regime. Because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take an internal revolution. So we need to speak. And it's, people underestimate the power of taking a moral stand, saying this is evil, this is wrong, you, you, know, you shouldn't do this. That is incredibly powerful. And if, if the West had done that with Hong Kong, I think China would have at least hesitated. This way, they got a freebie, right? N no cost. Maybe the people leaving Hong Kong is the cost. But even then, America didn't open up the doors to, to, to Hong Kong people who were leaving. A few countries did. But America didn't. I don't know if China has taken in any of the Hong Kong refugees, but the whole world should have said, okay, Hong Kong people are incredibly productive, used to kind of the values of freedom and liberty. Come, we want you. Please come. Nobody, very, I mean, I think the UK did it a little bit. I think Taiwan did it, obviously, but that's it. Australia, I think. Australia opened up its doors. Uh, thank you for your talk, sir. Um, I'd like to know what you think is the most promising development happening today to advance individual liberties. God. <laughs> the most, because I'm trying to think of any. Um, well, I think Russia losing is definitely a, a good thing in terms, of, uh, in terms of gaining perspective on authoritarianism. Um, what's the most important development? You know, I, I think ultimately that you will not get a real sustained move towards individual rights and towards individual liberty until Ayn Rand becomes a much more significant cultural figure, until her ideas are respected and debated and, 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 and are circulating in the culture. So I think anything that has to do with bringing her ideas into cultures, into countries, into, into the world is the most important thing that's happening today. And I think you're seeing that. You're seeing that. Uh, I mean, the last 10 years, the last uh, maybe 12, 14 years, have seen an explosion in um, Ayn Rand translations and Ayn Rand's popularity outside of the United States. Interesting kind of uh, interesting fact about Ukraine. In 2015 and 16, Atlas Shrugged was the best-selling book in Ukraine. It was translated into Ukrainian and it, in Ukrainian. It was already existed in Russian, but this was the Ukrainian. And it was, it was published in three volumes that came out separately. Uh, one in 2015, 16, I think, or two in 16, something like that. And during that period, it was the best-selling book in Ukraine. That's good. Now, you know, has it made Ukraine a free country? No, it's, you know, there's a long time before that happens. But there's a lot of young people who've read those books and who inspired and who are motivated to bring about that kind of reality sometime in the future. And I think you're seeing that in more and more pockets around the world. You're seeing her books translated into Japanese, obviously, but, um, you know, thanks to some people in this room, but uh, in places where we'd have never thought that it would be translated. Um, China, everyone, all of her books are in Chinese and selling. Uh, the only two major languages her books are not in are uh, Farsi, Iran, and Arabic. And there's real work to, to, to get them into Arabic. Uh, so every other language, every other language, basically her works are out there. And, and so getting her ideas out there, I think, is the most important and, and the most exciting thing going on. Yeah. Um, um, it might deviate from the topic today, but um, okay. how, I, I think the, the awareness of Japanese young people to politics is decreasing. And um, I think that leads to the, um, that leads to less 
freedom for the people in the future in Japan. And um, how, how can we solve and raise the awareness to the politics in Japan? Um, in my view, in an ideal world, people wouldn't be interested in politics. So the only reason today we should be interested in politics is because politics is interested in us. It affects our lives, it's involved in our lives, it's in every aspect of our lives, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, but you want to reach a state where the government is so limited and so small that, eh, I mean, in this party or that party, the differences between them are small, they're all basically respecting individual rights, who cares? So that's the ideal. But today, we need to care about politics because politics is in our lives. It's interfering in our lives, and we need to change that. And I'd say that the way to do that is not to try to interest in politics, per se, but to try to interest them in an ideal. Young people want an ideal. They want to believe in something better in something great, in something beautiful, in something amazing. It's, it's one of the things that happens to us as we age, we lose that, sadly. Most people lose that, right? They lose that idealism. But young people still have it, or at least have the desire for it. So what we need to capture them with is an ideal, not another shade of gray. And the problem with Japanese politics, which is similar to most politics, is it's different shades of gray. What, what's the difference? Should I care about these guys? Should I care about it? Because there's not that much difference between them. And they don't seem to have an effect. So one government comes into power and they do this and the other government, what's the difference? N nothing different happened, right? So what we need to interest them is not in politics as it is today and what it is possible and what politics can achieve in terms of increasing our liberty, in terms of getting out of the way. So I think it's idealism we should be striving for, and, 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 a, and a real positive, exciting, interesting, fascinating vision of the future, which could get, and this is why Ayn Rand appeals to young people so much, because Ayn Rand's an idealist. She, she, she portrays a, a, an amazing, beautiful future. She tells them what they could achieve, what is possible to human beings. Um, that's why her novels in particular are particularly appealing because they portray the kind of heroes that such a world could exist in such a world. So I think that's how we do it. I have a deep question, not so philosophical. Uh, deep but not philosophical. Right? I, was, I was taking notes <laughs> of your bite takes actually in a run out of pen. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, by the way, a member of uh, ethics committee of Libertarian Party of Russia of the political community. Okay. So, okay. Um, I'm not going to argue about the takes. Uh, I just have one question. Have you actually read Ayn Rand in any book of her? If I read Ayn Rand? Yeah. Yes. It doesn't feel like you did, because one of the major takes of Ayn Rand is the class struggle between um, oppressor and nomenclature, which, well, she's an ex-Soviet person, right? So she perfectly knew it. What she's talking about, right? Yeah. So James Taggart versus David Taggart, Taggart, right? It's not one country against another country. And surprisingly, for a person who's the president of the Ayn Rand Institute, you yeah. take a lot of takes about how one country is better than another country. Like, right, like what? Well, let me quote you. Uh, basically, three countries. Yeah, I believe some countries are better than other countries. I mean, uh, you don't have to quote me, I'll say that well, again. So, <laughs> so the yeah, iron take is that almost any country as a statist uh, organization is bad against its own people. Like, let's say you talk about uh, free speech and political prisoners mm -hmm. is what qualify a basically free, disqualify a basically free country into an authoritarian country. So, what's your take on Julian Assange, for example? Well, Julian Assange is a criminal for, for a variety of reasons. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly why Julian Assange is a criminal. Uh, uh, Snowden is a hero, but Assange is a criminal. Um, so, first of all, it's, it's pretty ridiculous to accuse me of not having read Ayn Rand when you clearly are completely ignorant of Ayn Rand's writings. Uh, she talks about differences between countries all the time. In all of her writings, in all of her essays, she talks about, uh, she, she even makes comments about Israel and, and the difference between Israel and other countries. And Israel at the time when she made these comments was a socialist country, and yet she viewed it as a superior country uh, to other countries. So, um, uh, you know, you can ask a question and you could disagree with me, 
but to start off by just um, uh, making silly accusations and showing off your ignorance is, is ridiculous. Um, Julian Assange is a criminal because Julian Assange has no respect for human life. He is willing to publish anything, including stuff that would, would harm human life, that would destroy the capacity of free countries to protect themselves and defend themselves. Um, he was willing, uh, he was willing to, to publish um, trade secrets of corporations, anything that's secret, he is willing to publish, including violation of property rights, which is trade secrets and, and corporate, corporate information, which is none of his business and, and is not in the public domain and the public has no, quote, right to know it. Um, he is not a defender of freedom and freedom of information or anything like that. He does not have a concept of freedom. He doesn't have the concept of individual rights or concept of property rights. But did so he's, he, not, he's did, not a good guy. Did he commit violence? He's I not, mean, you're talking he, about why freedom is a concept of free of coercion. Did uh, Adrian Assange coerce somebody to obtain this information? Did yes, he stole. Stealing is coercion. Yeah. He stole. He, 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 okay, other people stole it and he published it. So uh, the guy who buys stolen goods from the thief is not a criminal because, because he, even though he knows it's stolen goods, he's not a criminal. Of course he's a criminal. So once you are facilitating crime, so Julian Assange was facilitating crime by publishing stolen material. So he's a criminal. Um, I don't think there's any question. Snowden, on the other hand, clearly identified areas in which the United States were violating the individual rights of its own citizens made sure to take out of what he published that which could, uh, which could harm uh, agents and, and, and people, you know, people in, in foreign countries that, that might have been harmed by the release of the information, uh, tried to go through the channels to get things, uh, couldn't do that, so he released information. He's a hero. And I, and, 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 and I would... Like I said, he did steal. Yes, but he stole from those who do not have a right to keep it. So, which so is, in, your which opinion, is in your opinion, if there is a moral right, to, so if you say if you steal, but for good, like Robin, Robin Hood would do, right? Uh, no, Robin Hood's a criminal, right? Robin Hood's a criminal because he's- It's a morally justified crime. It's morally justified to steal from the government in order to reveal the government's criminality. So it's not, it's, Assange didn't do that. Assange would publish anything. And Assange would publish anything and, and it's not morally okay to steal from private businesses. But I don't want to, you know, so that's my opinion on Assange. You asked for it, you got it. I don't want to get into an argument about it. In terms of uh, differences, this is a problem with libertarians. The problem with libertarians, and you can see this in the new Mises caucus in the American Libertarian Party right now, the problem with libertarians is you cannot make distinguishing differences between countries. You, you, for you, for, for Maui Rothbard, North Vietnam was a better country than the United States, which is so evil. And so disgusting. I mean, he used to celebrate every time an American pilot got shot down in, uh, during the Vietnam War. You can be anti-war without relishing the idea of Americans dying there. You can be anti-war without wanting the North Vietnamese to win. When North Vietnam took South Vietnam, when they united Vietnam under communism, libertarians in America celebrated. This is why I don't call myself a libertarian. This is why I don't want to be associated that much with libertarians, because I think that's disgusting. That if you can't see the difference between communism, between authoritarianism, where you can't speak, where you can't, between Putin's Russia and Japan and the United States, then you're blind. And you're, you're making yourself blind, because you're not blind. You're making yourself blind. And by making yourself blind, you're destroying yourself. And by advocate, doing this in the name of liberty and freedom, you're destroying the liberty and freedom movement, and that's why nobody will take you seriously. So, of course, there's a fundamental difference between where if I say something and a policeman comes in and drags me off to prison, there's a big difference between that, between that plus all the other coercion, and where the coercion is limited to one sphere, let's say taxation or, or, or economics. It's still bad, it's still evil, but it's a different degree of evil. It's far less than a police state is. So yes, I, I evaluate countries. I would rank them. There's an economic freedom index for a reason. So you can rank them in terms of how free they are, and you can still condemn them all. And countries are legitimate. Ayn Rand was not an anarchist. Ayn Rand did not believe in anarchy. She argued against anarchy. She called libertarians in the 1970s hippies of the right, which was not a compliment. Um, 
she advocated, she loved America, she loved America as a country, she loved America in spite of hating its politicians, and she thought it was an amazing country, and she, when she compared it to the Soviet Union, she thought the Soviet Union was fundamentally evil, and she thought America was fundamentally good, in spite of the fact that there was still coercion going on. That's Ayn Rand. You call Japanese, for example, Japan basically for a country, right? So after, right after Snowden, your favorite guy, uh, they passed uh, a law called Tokutei Himitsu Ho Go Ho, which basically prevents things like Snowden ever happening again in Japan. It's it doesn't prevent. Snowden violated the law. So passing a law against Snowden doesn't help. So the whole point of Snowden is he violated the law. Right? No, no, I mean, they, they, that's the thing. I mean, it's actually a science. You can't have a law that prevents Snowden from happening. If you publish, if let's say you're Snowden and you leak information from Japan and you give it to me and I publish it, we both go to prison for treason forever, right? Yeah, so, that's, so there is no freedom of speech in that sense at all. Or like, I'm not even talking about human rights things. Like, I don't know, like, let's say women can't have uh, their own last names, you know, after they're married. Or like, they have to, uh, for example, stay divorced after a divorce for, for like almost a year. Uh, because, you know, God knows. So Japan could be freer. It's still much freer than yeah, Russia. That's, that's the point. It's, it's still, still much freer. Free. Yes, Japan that's the point. Be free. Yes, of course. There are, there are yeah. more oppressive reg regimes than others. Well, that's, that, makes that, that, that doesn't make you more take a moral stance saying like, oh, US uh, is all correct and Russia is all wrong. And nobody nobody no. said, you will never hear me say, you, you didn't you will even never hear me say the US is all correct. You didn't mention a single uh, example of US. You, your whole lecture was about how terrible uh, China and Russia is. Which is pretty, pretty much uh, China and Russia are terrible. Yeah, but like US is as comparably terrible. Uh, US is not as comparably terrible. It's well, not nowhere near as comparable. So, so uh, you, you, Iran war and Iraq war was totally justified, same as Ukraine war, right? There's a there's a massive difference between the one you are massive difference between the one you are and the one you are. Let's talk about Israel. In West Bank, if you enter a relationship with a Palestinian lady, you have to notify Israeli government and take a you know, twenty-seven month. You really shouldn't injury. talk about things you don't know anything about. Oh yeah, you, you clearly do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I was going to look, see if there were any other questions. Russia uh, uh, Russia あの、ロシアでも、え、ロシア政府、あの、ロシア宗教の、um, you talked about Russia, um, we heard that uh, someone in the Russian church was connected to people in power. And we are talking about um, people in a religious organization in Japan related to people in power in Japan. Uh, are there similar things happening in the United States as well? Yeah, so the connection between religion and state is, is one of the signs of the diminishing of freedom. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the relationships, you see that in, in theocracies everywhere. Iran is a good example. Uh, but, uh, but yes, the involvement of the, of the church in, in Russian politics is a bad sign. I didn't know religion was involved in Japan. That's not a good, that's not a good sign. And it's definitely rising in the United States. Uh, you're seeing the role of religion increase in the United States now. Um, you know, we just saw the Supreme Court rule on uh, abortion, uh, which, you know, they didn't use religious motivations to do it, but it's not an accident that all the judges who voted for doing away with Roe versus Wade are very religious and, and, uh, and have talked about their religion and how it affects their view of these things. Um, the, the whole view of abortion in the United States is very much guided and determined by, uh, by religion, uh, religious uh, orientation. But what's really scary about the U.S. is that there is a rise in the view, in the opinion, that religion should be more involved in the state. And there should be more um, relationship between religion and state. There's, there's a, on the right... Um, you know, the, there's, a, there's a group called National Conservatives who are, uh, you know, in, uh, who are committed to the United States as a Christian uh, nation. Uh, Marjorie Taylor, 
whatever her name is. This, there's a congresswoman in the U.S. who's recently said America is a, is a, is a Christian nation and uh, you know, the, the government should impose Christian values. Right? Very, very dangerous. It's exactly how you get the kind of authoritarianism uh, that, was, you know, that we're so worried about. It's a, it's a very slippery slope. Once you let religion into government, it's a very, very slippery slope towards um, complete. How many percent of Knesset is actually Orthodox Jew? Do you know? Yes, I, I do. As a percentage right now, so there's going to be an election. Orthodox Jewish there's going to be an election in Knesset. Huge amount. Yes, so 80%. What, so, what's the point? Yeah. Uh, what do you think about Bitcoin? 80%, you said? Yeah. 80%? Yeah. That's complete nonsense. So, now, now you're showing your ignorance again. Okay. Yes. What do you think about Bitcoin, sir? <laughs> Um, I think Bitcoin is an interesting experiment, right? Uh, I, which unfortunately is probably going to fail um, because I, I, uh, because I, th I don't think the governments of the world, I don't think the central bankers of the world are going to allow it to succeed. I don't think it can succeed without ultimately being allowed to succeed. Um, Bitcoin could be, uh, the usefulness of Bitcoin could be shut down pretty quickly and pretty easily. Um, Bitcoiners assume that we're all going to embrace Bitcoin and when the government comes to shut it down, we'll all object and therefore they won't do it. You know, that's science fiction in my view. Uh, you know, people, uh, people don't object when the government comes and takes their money uh, in the form of taxes. People don't object when the government uh, violates their rights on almost daily basis. Uh, they can object about Bitcoin. That's the one thing they'll object about. Uh, but but uh, so, and, and ultimately, I think that if you had a truly free market, if, just got, if government got in a way and you had real individual rights and you had free banking and banks created their own currencies and there would be, there would be a real competition, I don't think Bitcoin wins. I think Bitcoin loses. So I don't think Bitcoin is the solution in a free market. And it's certainly not the solution in a market that's not free, where governments have as much power as they do and can basically, they can basically make it illegal for you to use Bitcoin to buy stuff. You could still trade Bitcoin in the anonymous space in the cyber world, but it's, it's not useful. Um, I, I'm hoping, I don't think it'll happen, but I'm hoping that people who thought Bitcoin was an inflation hedge might have woken up because... It's, uh, there's inflation now, it's not act, acting as a hedge. It's acting as the opposite of a hedge. It's actually correlated. Uh, if, you look at the, if you look at Bitcoin, it's heavily correlated to the NASDAQ. It's heavily correlated to tech stocks. It's a technology. It's an interesting technology. But it's not a currency. It's never going to replace the existing currencies in the world. It's, it, that's science fiction. And it's, it's wishful thinking. And now I, I uh, sympathize with the wishful thinking. Because I'd love to get the central banks out of the business of currency. Ben. Yeah. Oh, um, I've been primarily in Jacobus for about coming up to 40 years, and I've been watching the world from over through those eyes. Um, and I realize more and more the importance of the um, uh, objectivist epistemology. And I think that that book is really um, an underrated masterpiece. Yep. And um, if that book were better known than that methodology, if you like, of, of the objectives of epistemology were better known, uh, that, that is the level at which I think so many arguments falter. Is people have the, the conceptual ceiling that she spoke of in one of her essays. And I see that uh, in all sorts of issues all the time, is that people can argue at a certain concrete level and maybe a, a, you know up one or two runs up yep. but they have a limit and they don't uh, they're aiming across above that to me the ladder of abstraction thinking was so valuable mm -hmm. and um, you can argue politics and so many issues at this ground level but if people are, are unable to proceed above it as most seem to be you're, you're banging your head against the wall so I, 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 I sort of am wondering and suggesting and, and inquiring about yep. the, the, the mission of the, of the Ayn Rand movement in promoting that book and that way of thinking. If I don't see it promoted so openly, I suppose. The I epistemology think, per se is... Yeah, I mean, the, the advocate, uh, you know, promoting epistemology, qua epistemology is hard. 
partially because the only way people get interested in epistemology is if you first show them why they should get interested in it. Um, so you, the best way to, um, I think, to promote her epistemology is to model it, is to model the kind of argument, to model the kind of um, uh, uh, conceptual use that she uses there, and then intrigue people through those ideas to then dig deeper into her philosophy and encounter the epistemology. You can't come at them with epistemology partially because they don't know that's what they need, right? They need it. We all know that's at the heart of it. Um, so I think that's one, so the one approach is to stimulate them to get interested in Ayn Rand, to get them excited about some idea. Often it's, a, it's in the ethics because they want to promote their own life. Those are the people you really want, the people who really care about their own life to some extent, or at least respond to that, or respond to the novels. And then they, you know, they're going to find the epistemology, they're going to find that. And we're going to be doing more courses and more. There's, we've launched the Ayn Rand University, and that'll have a number of courses on the epistemology uh, as well. So that'll be available online, and so that, that'll be, that'll be uh, heavily promoted. Um, so that's, uh, I think that's, the, that, that's one way. The second way is the real way in which you're going to change people's ability to think is not from them studying epistemology. That is going to be a very small group of people who are ever going to respond to that because it's hard. Uh, and it requires effort and it requires motivation. They have to want to do it. The real way you're going to do it is get them young. Is, is start not teaching epistemology young, but using the epistemology to create the right teaching methods. Using the mind. Yes. Teach them to think. Teach them to be rational. Teach them what it requires to form concepts, what they're doing somewhat automatically, teach them what that means and how they can test themselves and how they can challenge themselves. Clear and concrete. Yes, and... and, no, and teaches no. Anywhere, no, and, but it's worse than that. The way you're taught, the way you're taught what you're taught is anti this. So whether you're taught to memorize, that's anti-concept formation. You're not taught how the concepts are created. You're taught just to memorize them and to just regurgitate them. Or you're taught lots of concretes with no integrating abstractions. So the whole education system is geared towards undermining our epistemological abilities. And, this, and, and I think this is becoming worse, and this is why people's ability to think is declining. Because look, people think of all the scientists, and, and it, people could think 200 years ago, even though they didn't have Rand's epistemology. But that's because they had a... a, 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 a that implicitly a pretty decent epistemology. But our educational system, particularly in public education, is undermining that even that implicit good epistemology. If you have an explicit one, you can now teach them properly. So I'm encouraged by the fact that so many objectivists have gone into the field of education. And we have, uh, there, there are many, many schools in the United States now inspired by Ayn Rand, inspired by her epistemology, um, inspired by her ideas, uh, starting from pre-K, starting with Montessori, because Montessori's epistemology is very aligned with objectivism. So starting with Montessori and through the different age, age groups, I think that's where you really have an impact. That's where you really get a bang for the buck, is teaching people when they're young how to think properly. But yeah, I agree. I mean, if, if people can't think, then what's the point of talking to them? I have a question. Yeah. 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 But you said that we should um, um, we should improve our capability, epistemological capabilities. Yeah. But in the a in this uh, AI age, yeah, everything is uh, you know controlled by you know you know like in authoritarian country use the technology surveillance technology and uh, <coughs> we gradually yeah yeah miss our you know. Judgment. Yes. Abilities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what the authoritarians are now doing is the same they've always done, just much more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Now they have the ability to track you, to follow you, mm -hmm. and now the philosopher king can tell you what ice cream flavor you should buy, not just, you know, uh, 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 what to study in school. They can they can intervene at every level, and it's it's so, you know, the technology is a good technology. AI is amazing. 
but in the hands of the wrong people. It can be used to control and to provide you with the values that you should be picking for yourself, that you should be using your mind uh, for yourself. So it all comes down to um, do we give them the power to control us or not? And if we give them the power to control us, then, then it's going to be really bad. ロシアとか中国の話が結構されてたと思うんですけど私が特に気になるのは日本のことで今の日本の国民含めてだんだん国民負担率も全て上がっていってなんか我々の選択の自由というかだんだん国に全ての規制レギュレーションだったりまあ
いてはもう時間も大変ですぎてませんけど、本日のセッション動画は、後日、えー、今、チラシでお配りしている QR コードの先にもなっているんですけれども。えー、日本アイルランド協会の YouTube チャンネルにもアップロードされますのでそちらであの見直すこともできます、えー、今回のセミナーでアイルランドアイルランドの実装に興味を持たれた方はチラシのリンク先日本アイルランド協会までお問い合わせなどいただければなと思います次に私は1言ですが There is, a, we, we have launched this thing called Ayn Rand University. You can find it on,、um, just look, Ayn Rand University online. There are lots of courses.、Um, if you're interested in really studying, you, you, could, you could be a graded student. You can also audit these courses. The courses on a whole variety of topics.、Um, it's something that's going to grow over the years.、Um, we're, you know, we're interested in students from everywhere in the world. That's the beauty of technology. We, we're not limited geographically. Everything's online, including if you're a graded student, you don't have to come to campus. You can, get, you can take courses and, and、uh, be evaluated online. But there'll be a wide variety of courses. Please、um, sign up if you're interested. Go check it out I, and, and follow it because it's still developing. It's, 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 it's going to be a process, but I think very exciting. Thanks, everybody.